Hello and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's uh, Lost episode by episode review for Season 3, Part 2. Uh, so in this video I will cover episodes 9 through 16 of Season 3 of Lost. Um, this is part of my ongoing series to cover every episode of Lost in parts. Uh, so this video I will cover up to episode 16, One of Us of season three so i have to give a spoiler warning up to that episode if you haven't seen up to that episode you will not want to watch this video otherwise some things will be spoiled for you however if you haven't seen beyond that episode that's okay because i will not have spoilers from beyond uh episode 16 of season three so if you haven't seen say till the end of the show don't worry i will keep it uh free of uh spoilers beyond episode 16 of season three however i will have a spoiler section at the end of my video uh that will cover up to the end of uh the series but i will give a proper spoiler warning before getting into those kinds of spoilers so <coughs> I talked a bit about season three in my part one and how it was uh, very filler heavy because the showrunners uh, wanted a specific end date, something to work towards, and they couldn't work out a deal with ABC, so they were being very spiteful, and <laughs> they've gone on record saying that they were uh, purposely uh, delaying or like spinning their wheels. Uh, to try to piss ABC off to get them to agree to doing an uh, end date. And I think it's hard to say when exactly they came to a deal uh, with ABC. They announced it shortly before the finale aired, but I have a feeling that they came toward the deal uh, way before then because, uh, you know, of course the finale aired way after it was made, and I get the impression that the last batch of episodes season three, and in fact, I think the uh, Damon Lindahl even confirmed this, that the last batch of episodes in season three, they knew they had already agreed to come to an end date, so they knew they were working towards something, so those episodes got better. That hasn't happened yet in this batch of episodes. I think that's very clear. Although I would say, like, actually, I think this is a recurring theme with most of these mid-season reviews I do where I review the eight episodes in the middle of the season. It tends to always be the case where it's a mixed bag. There's some great episodes and there's some lousy episodes. And I think that's definitely the case here. And that was kind of the case in the first half of season, or first part of season three as well, where there are some episodes that are definitely filler that are just spinning their wheels. And there are other episodes that are actually really great. And among some of the best of the entire show, they actually do push the st uh, story forward a lot. So it wasn't like it's all filler, or they were all spinning their wheels the whole time. But I think, as I said in part one, season three in particular probably is the season that contains the most filler that they were spinning the wheels uh, the most. But that's not to say that they're still not some great episodes in there, which is why I disagree with anyone who says that season three is one of the worst seasons or that was lousy. In some ways, it's, it is one of the best seasons because the episodes that do hit their mark hit their mark probably better than in the previous seasons uh, because they were really starting to, um, you know, they've learned how to, how to really craft this show better. Uh, but anyway, enough preamble, <laughs> let me get into the episodes. So we start this video with what is, in my opinion, and I've gone on record saying this before, is the worst episode of the show. I don't know if I'll feel the same way after this rewatch, we'll see. But so far, yeah, I think this is the worst episode of the entire show, and that is uh, Stranger in a Strange Land. Um, so... <laughs> This episode is bad on many accounts. And I know many people will say, well, it's just the Jack flashbacks that are bad. The island storyline was actually somewhat decent. And I very strongly disagree with that. I think the island storyline was crap. The flashbacks are crap. This whole episode is crap. And this is the main, like, it's not just because I talked about whatever the case may be from season one. I said this is the definition of filler. Like, if you look up in the dictionary, this should have a link to the episode <laughs> under filler. Whereas this episode, it's, it is that. It is the dictionary definition of filler, but it's worse. It goes beyond 
just being filler and a waste of time to being actively bad and <laughs> actively annoying and bad writing, bad storytelling. And on top of that is complete and utter waste of time and adds absolutely nothing to the show going forward. So, <laughs> in this episode we get the burning answer to the burning question of what's the deal with Jack's tattoos. The question that absolutely nobody gives a shit about. And this is actually really insulting especially in retrospect seeing how many important burning questions that the showrunners like just ignored or left unanswered or gave us half-ass bad answers to without even trying and you know it's particularly annoying towards the end of this, uh, the series in season six where the the showrunners were actively mocking people who were asking for questions and yet um they find it fit to, i mean if you watch like the uh, so DVD extras of season one and two, you could, they always talked about Jack's tattoos. They always had a fascination with them. Oh, how weird is it that the doctor would have these tattoos? I don't think it's weird that doctors have tattoos. I w honestly wouldn't even notice them if all those bonus features weren't pointing out. So obviously, like, the people behind the scenes were really fascinated uh, by this. Now, having worked in sort of low-budget amateur films, uh, myself, I can tell like production design. We're actually working on set. You notice a lot of the details that don't really come off as strongly on, on film, like stuff in the background or you know tattoos or whatever. And so sometimes people who are working on it can get uh, fixated on things like that. But it's usually the job of the director um, to realize that the audience is not going to get as fixated on these minute details as those who are actually physically on set and can see these things would be because it's a different thing when you're watching it on screen and you're more focused on the acting and the characters and the story and stuff like that so you don't really care about some prop that's just in the background you can barely see and it's definitely uh, the case with the tattoos and so I think the showrunners really fumbled by you know fixating on something that anyone watching this should realize wouldn't give a shit about and I do start to wonder since I heard all those quotes about them uh, you know saying they were purposely spinning their wheels in season three to piss the producers off to say maybe this is that's why they made this episode uh is because they particularly focused on the tattoos because they didn't give a shit they were trying to make bad television they were trying to piss the producers off and i guess i could buy that but i don't excuse it that's no excuse for this episode i mean i talked in babylon 5 how um because uh jms did similar tactics in season two where he purposely purposely pissed the producers off because they were forcing him to do something he didn't want to do and how that was stupid and juvenile and the same thing most definitely applies here uh if they were purposely making bad television to piss the abc off to get them to make a deal then that's juvenile and dumb and they're they're hurting themselves they're shooting themselves in the foot they're cutting off the nose despite you know was it cut off your nose despite your face i think that's the saying this is what they're doing it's it's stupid and it doesn't excuse there's no excuse for this episode now the flashbacks take place in thailand because jack had this throwaway line in season two that he's been to thailand but do we really need to actually see that and i think a lot of these flashbacks in season three are due to some throwaway, throwaway line in the previous season which i think in the previous season perhaps they were purposely threw that line in there so they could have more fodder for their flashbacks such as when kate mentioned she'd been married in season one so they had to do a flashback in season three that showed her getting married but that flashback was useless and didn't add anything to the show and it's the same thing here with seeing jack go to thailand is useless and adds nothing to the show and plus it's just this is the flashback storyline is actively bad and frustrating because it's being weird just for the sake of being weird i mean so it's about i think it's very probably really offensive to uh anyone from thailand which would be my guess i would say it is probably really culturally inaccurate but regardless of that if you don't care about that fine let's just throw that aside regardless of that the whole episode the story itself was just um 
it was being weird or like strange for the sake of being weird and strange. This is lost at its worst. And this is why I say it's a very clear worst episode. Uh, because Lost always stories in mysteries. And sometimes it does it just for the sake of doing it. But oftentimes it can work. Like with the episode Numbers, one of my favorite episodes. Because it, even though they, you know, they knew they were never going to come up with an answer to that they were just throwing shit out because it weird shit out because it looked cool at least they did it in an effective way that created a very uh great storytelling creepy atmosphere uh developed a character a lot more it was just fascinating television this is the the opposite of that it's the inverse of that where they're being weird for the sake of being weird and it's terrible and it adds nothing to the character story it's not interesting doesn't and develop the character at all. Uh, this it, the f tone that they're going for of eeriness is fake, and you don't buy it. And also, <sighs> so, and also the thing with uh, Jack, like he goes crazy and he forces his girlfriend or the person he's having an affair with. I don't even know if you call him his girlfriend, but he's having an affair with her. Uh, or not an affair because he's not married. He's having a fling. I'll put it that way. He's having a fling and he goes, he says, she says that she does, she tells people who they really are. She has this mystical ability. Woo. And so he forces her, her to put the tattoo that says who he really is against her will. And he, so she says, oh, who you really are is you're a leader. And that makes you, um, that makes you sad or that makes you angry. And um, really? So that's, that's the important thing that the tattoos say, that he's a leader? Oh, jeez. I would have never been able to figure that one out. It's not like the show has not been telling me from the very first fucking episode that Jack is a leader who's angry and not happy. Jeez, thanks for the freaking newsflash. My God. I mean, couldn't they have come up with something better? I mean, even the whole purpose of the tattoo is a complete fucking waste of time. <sighs> Anyway, I'm sorry for ranting, but it just had to happen with this episode. And then the whole thing when after he forced her to have the tattoo, which really, he, I mean, the overtones of sexual assault the, in the scene where he's forcing her to do something she clearly doesn't want to do is very uncomfortable. It doesn't make me think very highly of Jack. I don't think it fits. I mean, Jack has always been a very stubborn character someone who like does what he wants to do and doesn't like to listen to other people but this i think takes it into a, a different direction that they definitely shouldn't gone in that makes the character a lot less relatable a lot less likable but anyway and then so after that scene uh, he's on the beach and the person you know the little kid who usually gives him sodas like is afraid of him runs off and that's supposed to be spooky and eerie and and then uh the chick's brother comes up and he, you know he met him before he's like hey i know you how's it going and so he takes off his uh you know pulls up his shirt and sees the tattoos and jack's just like don't touch me i was like okay regardless of any of the spooky eerie supernatural elements which is all bullshit anyway Jack should realize that he had just like forced this girl to do something she didn't want to do. No regard again, re totally regarding the supernatural elements. It was very obtuse of him to not realize that her brother may not be very happy with him right now, and especially after he sees the tattoos and gets confirmation that uh, Jack did in fact do what he said to he did and so of course he beats the shit out of him and Jack's actually surprised by this and um <laughs> it's like I know the whole thing about him saying oh you will get off this beach you will leave this country you will not come back I, I, that's supposed to be like eerie or foreboding and have a sense of mystery but it's just cheesy I'm sorry it's just it's just dumb and then <laughs> So this that whole flashback doesn't really make any sense. It doesn't really add anything to the story. In fact, I remember like there's this video, YouTube video out there that was like name listing off all the unanswered questions at the end of the show when it got to this episode. It was like, so what's the deal with Jack's tattoos? Actually, never mind. I don't care. And that sums up this episode. Like it's creating all these mysteries that don't make sense, but I don't want them to be resolved. In fact, there were rumors that the character of Arc, uh, sorry, I can't pronounce her name, but the the, you know the Thai girl that um, 
Jack's having a fling with. There was rumors that she would reappear uh, in, um, later in Season 3 or in Season 4. And when we heard those rumors, we are like, oh, please, God, no. Please, God, no. <laughs> don't reappear. We don't need follow-up to this episode. And thank God that those rumors turned out to be false. And at least, at the very least, I mean, this is the the nicest thing I can say about the writers, the showrunners about this episode. At least they had the good sense not to follow up on this episode. Now, <clears throat> let me get to the island storyline, because as I said, I mean, it's very much agreed upon that the flashbacks are total crap and the worst that the show has ever done but a lot of people will be like well the island storyline is kind of interesting i disagree i think the island storyline maybe not as bad as the flashbacks but it's still crap uh because we get the story of uh the sheriff as tom refers to her but later who say well he, she's not really the sheriff that's just what we call her which you know fair enough i can see where he's coming from there but she comes in and judges juliet uh, for, you know, killing uh, what's-his-face. And uh, so they're going to kill her, but then Jack manipulates Ben to uh, commute her sentence, but instead orders her to be Mark. Now, this is a very important storyline that will come up uh, later, like the Mark uh, that Juliet got will have uh, strong uh, indications of where her character goes. Uh, and and this, the character of Is Isabel, the uh, sheriff, of course, will be a recurring important character who will have uh, very uh, strong effects in the story and where it goes from here. Oh, just kidding! We never hear or see a mention of any of this shit ever, ever again. It was complete and total and utter waste of time. Like, you could really easily just not watch this episode and you wouldn't lose anything. I guess the only thing that you would lose is seeing Jack... Uh, go from the Hydra Island to the back to the main island and to see Kate and Sawyer uh, go back from the you know Hydra Island to the main island. But you actually don't need to see that. You could just assume that. You'd watch the next episode and see him back on the main island and just be like, oh, they're back on the main island. There you go. You don't need <laughs> this episode at all. Um, the whole thing about Juliet being marked, I mean, that was a bit cheesy. And I was stupid again. Never, never, not even the slightest, not even touched upon very slightly as is ever mentioned again. And the whole storyline of Juliet being put on trial um, to for killing Pickett. But why? I mean, Ben told her to... Um, you know, stop to let uh, Kate and Sawyer go so Jack would save his life. And in doing so, uh, Pickett was standing in, in her way, so she needed to kill him in order to do what she was ordered to do. So it doesn't really make any sense. And plus, you see the others who kill people right and left, willy-nilly, nobody gives a shit. I know you could argue that the difference here is they're killing one of their own. And indeed, that is, in fact, a lot of organizations are a lot stricter about killing one of your own than an outsider but still even so she was still only doing what ben told her to do and she needed to and ben didn't say go kill pickett but he said go set kate and sawyer free to in order to save my life and she needed to kill pickett in order to do it therefore she was doing what she was ordered to do and so she shouldn't have even been put on trial so this whole trial thing was fake stakes the uh, whole thing with Jack manipulating Ben it was a rehash of what they already done. In fact, Ben already said, oh, what is it going to cost me now? I already gave you a ticket back to the to island. It's just like the writers were self-aware that they were just rehashing the same story over again. And again, it's a total waste of time. And it counts for nothing. Now, the one scene... I wouldn't say I like this scene because I don't, but I was looking forward to this scene. I saw a preview before this episode came out, and they showed a preview of the scene where Cindy and the you know the kids from the tail section who we saw in the other 48 days were with her, and they went and visit Jack, and they're acting all weird, and they're saying they're gonna they're here to watch, and Jack's like, "What? Well, you have something to watch? Go watch!" And he yells at her. Like, when I saw that scene, I was like, that intrigued me. Like, that looked like a cool scene. But when I actually saw it in context, uh, it sucked. <laughs> and mainly because it accounted to nothing. 
I mean, it was the one thing I will say. It was good seeing Cindy again and, and the kids from the... It was good that they at least had follow-up on them. Uh, so we saw them. But they, I wish they would have gotten into more detail. I wish they would have expanded into the storyline. And I still don't really get what the deal... Because Cindy's acting totally brainwashed like one of the others. But she's not acting drugged the way that Claire was. So what what did they do to her and the kids? Did they brainwash them initially? But then slowly got them to um, reintegrate into the others. Where without being drugged... They would support the others in what they're doing, uh, which is possible. But I wish they would have explored that a bit more. I wish they would have explored Jack meeting up with them a bit more and what to deal with what's going on with the kids now. And the fact that Cindy said, oh, we're here to watch. Uh, so you assume what she meant by that is they're here to, to see Juliet's trial, which for one thing, why did they need to come to the Hydra Island just to see Juliet's trial? But leave that aside, let's say that they were. And why wouldn't she just say, I'm here to watch Juliet, I'm here to, to observe Juliet's trial? Why would she just be all vague, I'm here to watch? Like, that's like being, people don't talk like that in real life. That's being purposely vague in order to entice the, the viewer with like fake mysteries that don't really amount to anything. It's, it's fake dialogue, it's fake stakes. This episode actively pisses oh and i haven't even gotten to the kate and sawyer stuff this this stuff is a complete waste of time the whole thing with with uh <laughs> them and carl and carl's crying because he missed alex and and who gives a shit who gives a shit fuck i hate this episode fuck all right sorry <laughs> i haven't really ranted in these lost reviews yet so i'm very sorry but i had to do it for a guy and recently someone said oh stranger in strange land isn't that bad yes it is this is the worst this is a piece of sh anyway let me move over uh to the next episode which is uh trisha chanaka is dead now this episode does not anger me like Stranger in a Strange Land did. Uh, I think it was somewhat enjoyable to watch, but I also think this is not a good episode, and this is also huge filler. This episode did not need to exist. Uh, again, this is getting to the same sort of thing I was talking about before with the flashbacks of how there's a line of dialogue from previous season. They're like, oh, well, let's do a whole episode about that. So there's a line of dialogue in season two where... Hurley mentions that the fast food, the chicken place he worked at, got hit with a meteorite. And so we have to see that. But that's not really what the episode's about, or the flashback is about. Like, it happens at the start, and they give the episode its title from that. Uh, Trisha Tanaka was the record, uh, reporter who was killed in the incident where the meteorite hit. But then the rest of the episode is about his dad, who... Um, Never, not established. Now, again, I know some people will be nitpicking about me. It was like, well, didn't have to establish him in order for him to exist. Okay, that's true. Fair enough. But I have no interest <laughs> in this character. <clears throat> and the story that he goes with, like, faking out he got. I mean, it's not a bad storyline. I didn't actively hate it the way that the previous episode. But it's not very interesting. And it didn't really... I don't. It doesn't add anything uh, to Hurley's backstory. And the island storyline is probably more egregious in terms of being useless filler that has no impact on the show going forward. Now, I know the one thing, the one purpose that uh, this episode serves is to introduce a uh, foreshadow of the van, uh, which I'll talk about more in my spoiler section. Uh, <laughs> so, okay, that serves a poor purpose. You introduce the van, but um, they could have, honestly, they could have done this and a side plot of a, an actual episode that had a actual storyline that actually meant something. And then you have the side plot with Hurley revisiting the van that takes up maybe 10, 15 minutes of the episode. That's all you need. To, to craft an entire episode about Hurley trying to get a win by getting a van start. Who gives a fuck if he gets the van started or not? Talk about fake stakes and something I don't care about. Like, again, as I said, it was kind of fun seeing the interactions between Hurley and Jen and Sawyer and Charlie and having them drink beer with Skeletor and, and Sawyer say, bottoms up, and you get some great character moments between them, which is why I don't think this is a total horrible episode. But, again, 
those great character moments, those interactions, could very, very, very easily been in a side plot, a side storyline that took up maybe 10 or 15 minutes of an episode that actually meant something. <laughs> that actually pushed the plot forward to, to crack the entire episode about this. It was a complete and utter waste of time and with a complete and utter waste of flashback. So this is not a very good episode. Anyway, I don't enjoy watching this again. Anyway, let me get into the next episode which is Enter 7-7. Seven seven. I will be more positive about this episode, but um, still going to be a bit negative because <laughs> this episode was a split. This is one of the episodes we've seen this. Um, I think season three is probably more likely. You've seen a couple of episodes like this in season two, but season three probably is the one where it has episodes like this the most. And I'm talking about <laughs> episodes that have a really good really fascinating, really exciting, really interesting story, island storyline, but a totally useless piece of shit flashback. And so let me get into the flashback first. The Saeed flashback where he's, uh, you know, a, a chef and someone says, oh, I'm going to hire you at my restaurant, but it was like a lie and they actually torture him because uh, he, he tortured someone, uh, the you know, the guy's wife in a rock and the scarred her with burning oil and she was still experiencing trauma for that and so, so they're getting revenge on him and trying to get him to admit that he actually did it um this doesn't add anything to Saeed's uh character so we already knew he regretted the torture we already knew that he did horrible things in Iraq we saw that in his previous flashbacks and we already know that he regretted it uh and we already knew the impact that it had on people uh so seeing this again is just a um, totally unnecessary doesn't advance his character at all doesn't tell us anything about his character we didn't already know uh, it's not interesting it's just a rehash of things that we already get it's totally 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 useless but that being said the island storyline was really exciting the islands this is when the season really starts to kick forward as far as the island storyline goes because we get a storyline of kate rousseau saeed and Locke going across the island uh to find jack from the others and this is great because you get the idea that the, everyone's in it for their own personal reasons kate obviously just wants to rescue jack um, Russo just wants to reunite with her daughter because Kate told her that he that she saw her daughter while she was there. So she's looking for her daughter. Locke, um, well, we know at this stage, since we're up to episode 16, what his motivations were. But while this episode is airing, you don't know what his motivations were. But they hint at, especially between his interactions with Saeed and Kate, you get the impression that he's actually, he's not there for Jack. I mean, he says he's there for Jack, but you can tell that this, that he's full of shit. And that, that's really interesting. That's really intriguing. Um, but that makes Saeed, and I get why he was the focus of this episode, because it makes him in a very interesting position. Because Saeed is mainly there for the good of the group. Where Kate is basically there because she loves Jack, and she has a thing for Jack. Uh, Saeed is more of he realizes he he's there because he doesn't like the others and he doesn't want them to have any advantage and he wants to support his own like community because he knows that jack is a very good strong important leader and you get the impression that he's not very happy with uh, jack's replacement which was Locke, because he can tell that Locke's up to has ulterior motives that are maybe no good so he realizes that jack is the best thing for the group so he's more thinking he's more the like linchpin of all these people who have their own personal selfish motivations but he's more thinking of the community so that makes this a very interesting team up and it makes it interesting that they focus on Saeed in particular for this episode and so they encounter Mikhail who they we, we have hinted at earlier in the season when they saw you know they just called him patchy before when they saw the dude with the eye patch in the uh, video feed and now we actually get to meet him at a dharma station that was uh, responsible for out communication with the outside world which is a very interesting concept uh and it's a very I like the interactions 
between Saeed and Mikhail. Especially when Mikhail's pretending to be a member of the Dharma Initiative. Like, that was golden. Like, this is Saeed at his best. Because he's a character who's best used as someone who is able to see through the shit. He can tell when someone's lying. Uh, and it's so awesome that he was able to pick up that Mikhail was lying. And it's awesome that Mikhail was able to pick up that he picked up that he was lying. And of course, Saeed so told Kate about it. And Kate was very transparent. She was very bad at hiding things, which maybe it wasn't very smart for Saeed to tell her. And so he could def Mikhail could definitely tell that Kate knew what was going on. So we get one of my favorite lines of the season, which I thought was such a great line, when Mikhail says, when they're they're like still pretending that he's a member of the Dharma Initiative and uh, still pretending to be friends. And Mikhail just at one point says, why are we still playing this game? We all know that it's moved to the next stage. And then he starts attacking them. Like that was amazing. Such a good moment. Uh, and then you get the, you know, the attack between uh, Mikhail and Saeed and how uh, Kate gets the better of him before Locke even shows up, uh, <laughs> which is such a great. And then you have, you know, Locke saying that um, uh, Saeed is convinced that there's someone else there, but Locke says they searched every nook and cranny, and then Saeed pulls the rug out, and there's a hidden compartment, and he says, not every nook and cranny. Now, for this, I'm going to have to bring up um, the bloopers, because <laughs> I can never watch this scene ever again without thinking about the bloopers which i thought was absolutely hilarious now if you haven't seen the season three bloopers i'd recommend you watching them on youtube and coming back and watching this but it was it was so great when <laughs> because for this scene there's a blooper of when you had that line when Locke says i searched every nook and cranny and uh saeed pulls back the rug and goes like not every nook and cranny john <laughs> I think that's so hilarious. I, I can't watch that scene without thinking of that. Like, I hear the, his line of line read of saying it that way every time I watch the scene. It's so great. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, like, and the episode gets even more fascinating from there when uh, there's, they capture uh, Beatrice in the basement and there's a standoff with Locke, uh, with Mikhail have, holding a gun to Locke and them holding a gun to Beatrice. But Beatrice instead elects to just kill herself which just shows how serious the others are and how impossible they would be to manipulate or get, to get them to turn against each other. Um, and I love how uh, Saeed refuses to kill Mikhail. Now you could say, oh, this ties back into their backstory, but uh, to, you know, Saeed's flashbacks. But not really. You don't need those useless flashbacks. They're still a complete waste of time. Um, but... And then, of course, the whole thing with the Enter 77, uh, when Locke pushes the button, the whole station explodes. <laughs> like, that was amazing. That was really good stuff. Although, I will say, what you need to win a game of chess in order to get to that menu. What if you need to get to the menu immediately? That doesn't seem very practical. And also, like, um, the Marvin Candle was really vague. He was like, has there been an incursion by the hostiles? If so, Enter 77. Um, shouldn't they tell you that by entering 7-7 you're going to blow up the station that you're in? What if somebody doesn't know that and they s sit around and they get killed? The Dharma Initiative are so irresponsible. But anyway, <laughs> regardless of that, uh, I think this was a great episode. At least the island storyline was. The, the flashback sucks, so it's... They have to split the difference and say it's, it's a good episode, but not a great one. Anyway... Let's get into the next episode, which is uh, Par Avian, which I actually really like this episode. I think a lot of people didn't like this, and a lot of people might say this is more filler, but I actually like this. Now, this may have, in part, have something to do with the fact that I like Claire as a character, where I think a lot of people don't. Uh, I think Claire, I like the fact that they don't focus on her that much. So when they do, uh, she's a lot more interesting. Now, in this episode in particular, I think is really good at portraying the Claire and Charlie relationship. This is something they did well in season one, but I think in season two, they got too bogged down in them always fighting with each other, so the relationship became a bit annoying to watch. They were always just Skyping and whining uh, at each other. So, this actually brought it back to that very touching 
relationship and showed the love that exists there and uh, it was, and even though you did get a conflict between them, it was like more believable. And but it, it was bookend, like the episodes start and began, or began and ended, with uh, showing how loving the relationship is. And most because we all know, and they hammed this home throughout the seasons that Charlie is obsessed with Claire, and that he he's in love with Claire, and he'll do anything for her. But it's good seeing why what Claire gets out of. It the relationship what she sees in Charlie and why she loves Charlie and that's what came across in this episode uh, that I think really enhanced their relationship which I think is one of my favorite relationships of the show I'm much more interested than I am in the whole Kate love triangle thingy uh, because this felt more down to earth and more relatable and more adorable I should say and um, this episode in particular uh, we get the story of Claire finding out about what Desmond told Charlie. And this is sort of the looming storyline of Charlie in Season 3, that he's going to die. And we get more instances of uh, Desmond seeing Charlie die and then saving his life. Uh, and it ties into, you know, the whole her whole plan to use a bird to send a message. And that ending where they actually write a message and Charlie's reading it out. It was really good really touching ending uh and so i so i so i love that storyline i think it was it was a good character storyline. and plus you also get the storyline of um Locke, kate and uh rousseau and saeed now having mikhail and tell uh continuing their journey uh and they come across the pylons and of course this is when the you know lock just throws <laughs> mikhail through the pylons and kills them and they just look to lock and he's like what i i didn't want to bring him along in the first place i didn't tell you guys to bring him we should have just killed him in the first place <laughs> like that was great it was a good interaction uh between between those characters and the sonic fence of course which will become important later on is established here so that was great to see uh so this is a really good episode now the flashbacks weren't really the strongest uh we get the revelation here that uh Christian Shepherd is really her father so meaning that she's actually Jack's half sister which I don't know <laughs> like I mean this is another thing that they set up for in season two because the Anna Lucia flashback where we see Christian yelling at some woman in Australia saying he has the right to see his daughter I think pretty much everyone predicted that that meant that Claire would be his daughter and so we get confirmation there you go it is in fact does mean that Claire is his daughter um, but what, does it really change anything for the show or the characters? Not really. I mean, it's just a cool little tidbit. Um, what I think is more touching is the story with her mother and how she was in the car crash that was, uh, her fault and how she felt guilty over it. So that scene at the end where she's crying over her mother and saying, you know, apologizing, uh, that was a very touching scene. Uh, so the flashbacks weren't bad. Uh, I wouldn't say they were great, uh, but they were interesting. So this is, the, this was a good episode. Uh, not one of the best of this show, that's for sure, but... Uh, it was decent. I liked it. I think it had a lot of heart. It had a lot of character. Uh, so I enjoyed it. So anyway, uh, let's move over uh, to the next episode, which is The Man from Tallahassee. <laughs> now, uh, this is one, one of the fan favorites of the show, and for good reason. I think this is definitely a great episode. Uh, this is when uh, the, you know, Locke, Saeed, and Kate finally come to the others camp and they see Jack's playing football <laughs> and so the, and the scenes we get between Kate and Jack are amazing uh, in this in this episode where Jack's like you know I wish you hadn't come for me I told you not to come because I'm getting off the island and at first like Kate thinks that Jack's brainwashed she's like no I'm not brainwashed I'm still the same Jack I always was but they're letting me go home. <laughs> so I'm, I can go home and I can come back and rescue everyone. So this is his attempt to do good. Um, and it was great seeing the interactions between them saying like um, when Kate's like, how can you trust him? He's like, I trust him because you told me to. <laughs> Which is really good. But then 
But of course, what this episode's really about is Locke and his. Uh, we find out his true motivations for coming on this journey. It's not to rescue Jack. It's and actually, it's interesting watching this. And if you watch the earlier episodes, building up to this in retrospect, knowing what Locke's motivation are, they were totally hinting at it. Like every time. Kate or somebody mentioned that they had means of getting off the island and that they come and go from that. You can see Locke sort of perk up and that, that got his attention and that's the one thing that was sort of driving him and it, and it pulls into his whole theme of his connection to the island so and how he thinks the others are cheating by just coming and going as they please and how they have uh, chicken in their refrigerators and stuff and that they don't truly appreciate the island. And I love because this interacts with the others and how we're learning that they're all about worshiping the island but Locke thinks that they do a horrible job at it and it's hard to say that he's totally wrong here and I love getting the interactions between him and Ben where he's like Ben's like well you've been on this island for all of two months I've been here all my whole life what makes you think you know more about the island than I do and he's like well because you're in a wheelchair and I'm not <laughs> amazing and uh, like all the interactions between like Ben and Locke were amazing in this episode these actors are so great the like, chemistry between them and like the whole thing where he's holding uh, Alex hostage in the closet while Tom uh, while Richard Opera comes in and talks to him and uh when and so Ben's like bring me the man from Tallahassee and after Richard leaves uh John's like uh the man from Tallahassee is that some kind of code and then Ben's like unfortunately we don't have a code for there's a man in the closet holding my daughter captive but we obviously should like <laughs> that's great like the interaction between these two is so great and the way that Ben sort of taunting him and nagging him about oh I know you're back I know how you got in the wheelchair now for those of you who are like binge watching this or watching this along with me may not be aware that this is season three so it's been three years uh, since the start of the show and in that time the audience been wanting to know how Locke got in the wheelchair because this is a lingering mystery that has yet to be answered like the thing about Kate what she did that was answered in season two and and uh the whole thing about how did Locke get paralyzed like that is yet to be explained so that's something people are yearning dying to see and we finally get that in this episode and it's absolutely amazing it was amazing how they built up to it uh, in the island storyline with Ben sort of taunting him because we know that the others know everything about their backstory, have files on them and whatnot, so it makes sense that he would know what's going on. And I, it felt natural the way that he didn't give away what it was until the end of the episode, which I like. Sometimes it's very obvious they're withholding information just for the plot. But this was not one of those times. This time it felt natural. And so the actual flashbacks where we find out what happened that was his own father like it was built up too nicely like i like how it showed john as a broken man because not only was it, it was because his father cheated him but his girlfriend left him and so he's a broken man he's pathetic he's upset he's depressed which is actually kind of different than what we saw him in, in walk about which was right before he came to the island because you, uh, some people would say that he's a pathetic working in a box company but he had hope he had a glimmer of hope whereas here he had no hope he was just depressed and it's because of her fa his father and when he saw him pulling another griff he tried to stop him and what did his father do in response tried to kill him and that is what resulted in him being paralyzed and ended up in the wheelchair that was such a heartbreaking tragic moment and showed just how despicable this guy is and how hard Locke actually had it and the way that they tied this into the reveal that Locke's father is actually on the island <laughs> that was a huge uh, shocking ending and of course you get the whole thing with Locke blowing up the submarine which of course pissed the fuck you know jacked the fuck off and it showed for sure that Locke does not want them to get off the island because really if you think about if you boil down the motivations of the main characters of the 815 survivors of Jack and the others their main ultimate goal that they're all working towards the thing they want the most is to get off the island is to get rescued is to go home and it's so interesting that Locke wants the exact opposite so it kind of makes him a villain but he's not a villain 
really he's a character that you you care about and someone who thinks is actually correct because he's putting the others in their place yeah he wants his motivations are directly opposed to jackson the way they pulled this off is that you know i never thought of Locke as a villain because i think some people i think the writers themselves were saying that in the first season they tried to make him a villain some people watched the show said oh he's the bad guy and i never got the impression that he was the bad guy and i still don't I just think that it shows the opposing views of Jack and Locke and how their main motivations were opposed. No place does that come to a head more obviously and more strongly than in this episode where he takes away Jack's chance at going home. He takes away the chance of being rescued. He destroys it, right? And he didn't even have to. Like, Ben even pointed out that they lost communication with the outside world and then once the sub left... They were never coming back, which means that Jack's intentions of saving everyone wasn't going to happen anyway, so he was full. So in that way, you could say Locke was doing him a favor. But of course, Jack's not going to see it that way. And of course, he takes away Juliet's chance to go home. Uh, so <laughs> that was amazing. Uh, so this was a great episode. Anyway, let's get into the next episode, which is Expose. Now, <laughs> this is a very polarizing episode. It's a very controversial episode. I've heard some people say they hate this episode thing is one of the worst of the show. What the hell were they thinking? This episode is a complete waste of time. This is total filler. I hate this episode. It sucks, it sucks, it sucks. That's not what I'm saying. Some people say this. Or others will say this episode is actually awesome. <laughs> this is a show being fun, being funny. It's we're really playing with itself, not taking itself too seriously. Uh, so it's one of the best of the show. I have heard that opinion. Now, as you might suspect, I lie somewhere in between. But I lean more towards liking this episode than disliking it, if I would be honest. Um, because as I said, so let, let's get full into the whole Nikki and Paolo thing. Uh, because I talked about this a bit in part one, how I liked Nikki and Paolo, or at least I liked the concept of them, maybe not the characters themselves, but I liked the concept of taking two of these background characters who never appear and promoting them to main character status. I, I do like that a lot. Uh, but I, as I said in part one, I don't think the showrunners executed this concept very well. Uh, and I think, um, as I said, I think Damon Lindelof... It, did it really half acidly like i don't think he was really into it i think he was partly just doing this to uh, piss the producers off and spin the wheels so he didn't really he never really believed in this idea so they didn't really execute it as well as they should have um now this i was actually quite upset when Nikki and Paula died at the end. <laughs> I wanted to see more of them, honestly. I wanted to see, especially after this episode where they exp they explored their characters and explained their characters more, um, I, I was a bit upset that they died. But, of course, a lot of the haters were like, oh, thank God, <laughs> they got poisoned by spiders and buried alive. That is the best thing that could ever happen to them. Fuck those characters, which... I was never on board with that. I didn't disagree. But, you know, and, and my part one, I talked a lot about how if they had slowly introduced these characters more over the seasons and had, like, hinted at them in the background, uh, that it would have been better. The, the issue with how they, with the characters and how they were received had a lot to do with how they were introduced, how you never see them. All of a sudden, they pop up out of nowhere and start acting like main characters. And be like, Hurley, what's wrong? And you're just thinking, who the fuck are these characters? Why are they acting like that? So, uh, that was a bad introduction the way they did it. Um, and they try to, I think it's a bit too sort of a meta, too personal, is how they d have Sawyer act in this episode where every time he sees Nikki, he's like, who the hell are you? Because sometimes he's being really obtuse. Like, he, sh he should know who she is by now. But really, they're doing this so Sawyer can be a surrogate for the audience because that's what the audience is thinking. Who the hell are these characters? You know, and I still stand by that they should have slowly introduced these characters over time and they would have been better received, which I think is true uh, when you look at other supporting characters like Rose, Art, and even Frogert, who are all better uh, received because these characters were slowly hinted at and slowly introduced over time and they just didn't pop up out of nowhere. Well, Art's kind of did pop up out of nowhere, but then 
they didn't, they didn't treat him like a main character for the whole season. <laughs> like, he was just in the, those two episodes, so he was a bit more accepted that way. So, um, if, and I still stand by if they would have done that, it would have been better. But, it occurred to me as I was watching this episode that they actually could have went the opposite way, and that would have worked better as well. And that is not having these characters introduced at all before this episode. Like, I think they would have been better off had they not shown them in the previous episodes, had they not just went to the Pearl Station with them for no reason and started acting like main characters when you had no idea who they were. Where if you got to this episode, you had never seen these characters before, and all of a sudden you see these characters <laughs> and, and uh, act like... And, in fact, this episode almost reads like that a bit. It kind of contradicts, like, it's particularly with Sawyer being like, who the hell are you? It contradicts the fact that we have seen these characters a lot throughout Season 3. So if this episode began and it started with, you know, Nikki running through the jungle and digging up the diamonds and digging a hole for them, if we were like, we had no idea who she was, and at this point you don't know who Paulo is, and then later in the episode, you know, Hurley's like, oh, Paulo's her boyfriend, and then we see Paulo lying down, and that's her first introduction to Paulo, and we see him in the flashbacks at the same time, um, I actually think that would have worked a lot better. And so we would have, and especially how their flashbacks continue on to see... Uh, like, their experience of the plane crash in the early days being on the island. Like, all that stuff, I think, I started to realize this would read a lot better. And I think the audience would hate these characters a lot less if they only appeared in this one episode. And we never saw them before. Of course, they died at the end or after. And they were just in this one episode. And then all of a sudden we get... So it's just all of a sudden saying these are background characters who were there the whole time, but we just never seen it focused on. And that's why the Next Generation Lower Decks episode, which is the episode uh, the producers cited that these characters were based on, that's why that episode works. Because it didn't like have these characters... Uh, pop up earlier in the season to act like main characters and be like, oh, Picard, what's going on? It's like, who the fuck are you? But <laughs> instead, you just see them for the first time in that episode. They're main characters for that, for that one episode, and then you never see them again. That's why that episode worked. So I actually think if they did the same thing with these characters, Nikki and Pablo, um, they would have worked a hell of a lot better, particularly... And it seems like they really structured this episode that way, so the fact they appeared earlier in the story actually undermines this episode, in my opinion. Uh, but anyway, uh, another really important thing I want to talk about with this episode is the best scene in this episode is not in this episode, which really pisses me off. And I think this is probably the strongest case, in my opinion, of not just TV, but films of anything of a deleted scene that being deleted when it shouldn't have. When really it was the best scene of the episode. Uh, there's a scene, if you have the season 3 DVD, I highly recommend watching it if you haven't seen it. You'll find it in the section, not in the deleted scenes section, but there's a section called The Lost Flashbacks. And every DVD has it. Well, I don't know why they do this, but they take a couple of uh, deleted scenes that were flashbacks and they put them in this section called uh, The Lost Flashbacks, where it's a flashback that was deleted from the episode. And from this episode, if you go to the one listed under Exposé, it has a scene of uh, the Purple Sky scene at the end of Season 2, the Live Together, Die Alone, where you know Desmond turns the failsafe key and the whole sky goes all purple and freaks out and goes electromagnetic event. Um, but it shows it from Nikki's perspective, which I thought was amazing. Because, first of all, this, that to, up to this point in the series, I do think that is the most iconic uh moment of the show and like i i think it's i think they totally wasted time by having showing jocks uh, jack's uh, live together die alone speech which didn't add anything to nikki's character by the way it was just there for nostalgia purposes and yet they didn't have to keep this in not only that but the way nikki reacts to the like the electromagnetic event where she starts freaking out she's like what's going on like she freaks the fuck out which is 
a natural reaction. It's a reaction we needed to see. It's a reaction that makes sense because she's supposed to be... She's more of a surrogate for the audience. She's a character who's not involved in all the main shenanigans like Hurley and Jack and Sawyer and all the other characters are. She's just some some random person who just happens to be on an island. So this weird shit starts happening and it makes total sense that she would have freaked the fuck out. And plus, after that, we get like the defining character moment for Nikki and Paolo which really uh, uh, informs their character story for not just for this episode, for the, but for all of their parents, and it makes the rest of the episode and it makes the relationship make sense. And how you know Nikki freaks out and she says that uh, she's like really in the vulnerable position, and she says she doesn't want to find the diamonds anymore, and uh, that she loves Paolo, and that they want to, uh, that she feels she needs to make a better effort to. Um, get to know the others in the island and not be so isolated which is setting up to why they started appearing more in season three because this takes place right at the end of season two so that makes sense in that way uh but also more than that um it shows the kind of relationship that nikki and paulo had and why because paulo's whole thing is that he did hid the diamonds from her because he loved her and he didn't want her to stop loving her. But here it makes it clear that, that she does love him. And so this is an important character story for both of them. It drives the episode. Why the fuck was it deleted? This is probably one of the dumbest cho uh, choices I've ever seen ever of them deleting a scene. It's like if you went to Empire Strikes Back and deleted the scene where Darth Vader says, Luke, I'm your father. Or he says, no, I'm your father. Let me correct that correctly for all the, you know, perfectionists. Kind of Actually, that's not what he said. It's a misquote. Yeah, okay, whatever. He says, no, I am your father. There, are you happy? But anyway, as, as if they deleted that from The Empire Strikes Back. It's the most important scene. It holds the whole episode together. And this deleted scene, and like, every time I personally watch this episode... I have to watch the deleted scene. I cannot watch this episode without going to the bonus feature DVD and then watching this deleted scene immediately after because this is vital to the episode. This should have been in the episode. So it pisses me off like to no end that they... How could they delete this scene from the episode? It's the dumbest... Anyway, I'm not going to harp on this forever. But uh, ultimately... Um, I do like this episode. I, I don't think it's the best. I think, like, the ending where... Uh, I think the focus on... It has some great funny moments with, like, Hurley and Sawyer trying to figure out what's going on. And you get some cool character interactions. But, like, the whole thing of Son finding out that it was Charlie who beat, him, who beat her up in Season 2. Like, I don't know. That's kind of tying up loose ends, but I don't really think it's that interesting. But, um... The whole thing with uh, Nikki and Palu uh, actually being alive the whole time, and it's like a dark Twilight Zone type, purposely ironic ending that they hurling the others think that she's dead. And at the start of the episode, she said something they couldn't figure out. They thought it was power lines. It said, <laughs> it said plywood. What else did they say? Oh, Palu lies is what Hurley come to the conclusion, and the audience said, "Oh, that's what she said." But actually, she was saying paralyzed. I, I think that's kind of cool. I do kind of like that. But it's kind of dumb that uh, I think it's too uh, shock value-ish. It's too like, oh, look at how dark and ironic we're being that uh, they were alive the whole time. And so they're burying them alive. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, that's too forced. They tried too hard with that. As I said, I actually think I would have liked this better if they lived. But... If this was a standalone where we never saw these characters before, I do think it makes sense to kill them off. Uh, but don't be so like, oh, about it. Come on. But anyway, so it's a decent episode. I don't think it's a great episode. I don't think it's a horrible episode. It's, it's okay. <laughs> anyway. So then we get into the next episode, which is Left Behind. Now, this is another... Um, filler episode that I don't really care for. It's another episode where I think you could just take it out completely uh, and it wouldn't affect anything. Although the flashbacks is maybe, I don't know, the flashbacks are a bit silly. But I do like the fact that they uh, had Cassidy reappear who appeared in Sawyer's flashback in season 2 and how 
uh, they teamed her up with Kate, which I actually think was a pretty cool pairing. And it's a cool uh, example of the Six Degrees thing that they kind of weren't doing in Season 3 as much as they were doing in Season 2. So I think this is a cool sort of that these two people actually met in previous lives and they both had uh, ties to Sawyer, uh, which is pretty interesting. And I like do like how uh, Kate was the one that suggested that she... Uh, turned Sawyer into the police, and that's how he ended up in prison, which was saw in the earlier flashbacks this season, which was uh, pretty cool. I didn't like that. But um, the storyline of Kate trying to reconnect to her mother, that was a bit silly. And especially the scene where she actually does talk to her mother, and her mother says, like, next time I see you, uh, I'm going to call for help, which is supposed to reference uh, the season one flashback in Born to Run where uh, Kate's mother says, help, when Kate comes up. Now, that's stupid. It's bullshit. Because in that episode, it was very clear that the mother was actually distraught and in fear for her life and actually thought Kate was there to kill her. It's definitely not the case as it applies here where uh, Kate's mother is very lucid and uh, very reasonable and just calmly states, well, next time I see you, I'll call for help. That's such a stupid setup that makes the payoff even worse So we definitely didn't need, so that's bullshit. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the flashbacks are kind of okay, uh, kind of not. Uh, the island storyline is a complete waste of time. Uh, having, like, uh, a lot of people I remember when this episode first came out referred to it as hot girl and girl action because it had Kate and uh, Juliet slip in the mud for no good reason and then initiating the some good old fashioned mud wrestling for tantalizing for those male audiences. <laughs> it's just so, it's just, a lot of people call it like a very obvious, like cheap. Uh, attempt to uh, ramp up the sex appeal and gain more views. Whereas, you know, those involved in the episode said that they weren't even thinking about that when they filmed it. It's just they thought it was natural, like there was some mud there, and they thought, oh, wouldn't it be cool if they slipped in the mud and ended up, you know, uh, having to deal with that. Um, which I, you know, I believe, I'll give them the benefit for the doubt, but I don't think it changes the end result, which comes off as kind of watch this mud wrestling. But <laughs> I didn't focus too much on that aspect of the episode myself. And I had said before, and I hadn't really gotten to this in my reviews, that I didn't really like the character of Juliet. And I think she was okay, but it's episodes like this where I don't like her. That kind of pissed me off. Because um, and this is in contrast to Ana Lucia, because a lot of people didn't like Ana Lucia in season two, but I liked her just fine. I actually didn't like that she died. I wanted to see more of her. I thought she was an interesting character, but Juliet was the character I didn't like, and a lot of people were seen to be okay with her. And for me, it has a lot to do with the fact that arrogance is a personality trait that I probably liked the least. And I don't like how the others, and then Juliet by extension, are being all arrogant like they know everything. And this episode in particular, I think, is a prime example when uh, Kate tells Juliet that she doesn't know Jack. Uh, well, not... <laughs> it's funny the way I said not know, you know, Not know Jack as in you don't know Jack shit, but it had, don't know Jack as the character of Jack. It's like, you don't know Jack. And then she says, well, I know, and she recites all this information that she read from his file, like that he was married and his father died in Sydney and all this, these, you know, clinical details. And she states it so arrogantly, like, oh, wow, wow, you're just a stupid little, you don't know anything. I know everything about Jack, blah, 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 blah. And that kind of arrogance is what really pisses me off about her. And what I don't like is that this episode itself, the writers seem to side with Juliet in this situation that she does that she really does know Jack because Kate doesn't have a retort for this she's just like okay she changes the subject well we better get moving where I think Kate had a very good retort that she should have said she should have been like yeah those are details you read on a page that's not knowing the person knowing these specific details that you can read on files not the same thing as knowing someone knowing how they tick knowing their personal emotions uh how they you know what they look like when they get up in the morning like little details like that that kate could have hammered julie at home on and so i hate the episode that she didn't do this i hate the the fact that they were trying 
to pull it off that Juliet got one up on Kate. Well, I don't think Juliet really has a case. She's just listing off clinical facts. That is not the same thing as knowing someone, and it pisses me off that Kate didn't hammer her on this like she should have. But, <laughs> regardless of that, the whole thing about Juliet, like, handcuffing herself to Kate, like, that was really dumb. And then, you know, you get this cathartic moment with Juliet, um, where she says, oh, they just left me, and she's supposed to, uh... <laughs> to show how emotionally distraught she is that the others just left her behind, which is totally undone in the very next episode where we find out that she's just putting on an act and the others didn't leave her and she was just implanted there. So that makes this whole episode a waste of time. I don't like this episode. Anyway, so let me move on uh, to the next episode, which is um, One of Us. Now, this is a good episode. I don't think it's great, but it is really decent. It's, uh, more interesting Juliet flashbacks because we get her time on the island uh, and how she uh, joining the others and her relationship with Ben and her purpose of trying to save pregnant women, how it's taking a toll on her. And I think, honestly think these are the flashbacks we should have gotten and not in Portland. Because I think this makes more sense. I guess they wanted to withhold the information, keep you in suspense of why Juliet wanted to get off the island. But I think that's a mistake. I think it would have made more sense. Because this explains why she wanted to get off the island so badly and why she wanted to kill Ben. Uh, because he was preventing her from getting off the island and he was being a dick to her. Uh, so I actually think this would have made more sense coupled with that story. I think it would have been a really great crescendo for that episode when Kate reveals... Uh, that Ben uh, made a deal with her to let her go off the island, and we find out that's intercut with the flashbacks where we see Ben preventing her from leaving the island. That would have made a lot more sense. Uh, so I think that's a failed opportunity there. But um, so, but the flashbacks themselves were pretty interesting because we see you know, like Mikhail looking up the details of the flight, so that gives us a bit more uh, background. And I like how Ben sort of is like. You know, who knows? Maybe there's a pregnant woman on that plane. Ho <laughs> ho. Which I actually like. I think that does work. And um, it was a very emotional scene where Juliet uh, sees the footage of her sister who's alive and well uh, in Miami and she's crying. Like, that was a good emotional scene. Uh, so I do like the flashbacks. And the island storyline was also pretty interesting how. Uh, Obviously, Saeed and the others were at the, the camp were not very uh, kind to Juliet and very suspicious of her. Um, I didn't really believe Hurley, though, how Hurley was being kind of a dick to Juliet, and he sat with her just to be like, oh, I'm just here to keep an eye on you. He's kind of threatened her, too, by saying, oh, see that grave up there? That's where we buried Ethan. And it's like... That doesn't fit Hurley's character. I think if anyone was going to be sympathetic to Juliet, it would be Hurley. So, I mean, obviously he has a thing against the others, but um, I don't think he'd be a total dick like he was in this episode. But anyway, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so I think the, maybe so the way some of the characters are acting were a bit obtuse, like the way that uh, Saeed and Sawyer, like, we're going to stop Juliet from getting the medicine. And, uh, again, she be like, all arrogant. She says, like, oh, Saeed, you tortured people. Do you know about this? And said to Sawyer, it's like, oh, did they, everyone know you killed someone before you got in the plane? And that's what convinced them to let her go? I don't buy that. I think, well, I think they were being obtuse from blocking her in the first place. Because they should have realized that even if she was lying like this, if there's even a chance that she could save Claire's life, why would they block her and have this out with her now and why wouldn't they do it afterwards like after she saved Killer's life why wouldn't they then corner her and be like look tell us everything you know or kill her i mean you could say oh it's because she saved Claire's life so she earned brownie points yeah i don't buy that <laughs> so some of the character motivations felt a bit contrived uh, for purposes of the plot uh but other than that i did think it was interesting of course we got huge revelations uh more that tied into why um 
uh, what happened with Ethan and Claire and why Ethan abducted her. And I totally think all this was thought up in retrospect, but it fits, so I, I forgive it, and I think it actually works. Uh, because it all fits together nicely that um, Juliet was actually because this continues on the flashbacks we see here trying to save pregnant women and so it makes sense that she can, when she found out about Claire that they had this as a control study where that's why Ethan was there injecting her with Juliet's medicine and um, and it, but it's hard to say whether or not this actually uh, was the factor that saved Claire's life. I think it had more to do with the fact she was nine months pregnant before she came to the island, so she never got that sort of uh, affected by whatever it was the island was doing to make pre pregnant women die. I think that had more to do with it, but the medicine that Juliet gave her might have helped, maybe, I don't know. But it was an interesting revelation uh, and how Juliet explains that Ethan took Claire on his own, which does match up with what we saw in maternity leave. Uh, and so I think it all made sense. Now, it was kind of a cool scene at the end where you get the, you know, Juliet setting up tent and everyone's all being all lovey-dovey with her. And that's intercut with uh, Ben saying, you know, the flashback where Ben's telling her it's all set up and saying that she's infiltrating and she's going to mark the tent of the pregnant woman so that they can come take all the pregnant women, which, you know, I'll get to that storyline later. But <laughs> it was an interesting um, backstory. It was, a, it was a cool sort of deceptive ending that once you just warmed up to Julia, you find out she was sort of implanted as a spy, which does make sense. But... It's really interesting because when I first saw this episode, uh, I had my doubts that Juliet was really into it, but it was my brother who actually made the comparison to the scene where, that scene where Ben is saying, do you have a problem with this? She's like, no, I'm going to do what I say. I'm going to do what you say. It's all going to go according to plan. But she looks at that gas mask and she, you can tell us there's just something she doesn't like about this. She doesn't like this plan. And something's turning in her. And my brother made the comparison to D Space Nine. If those who have seen the final season of D Space Nine, the way Damar was acting when he was with the Dominion and Mayun, where he was drinking his canar and he would look in the mirror and look disgusted at himself. He made comparison to that, the way Damar looked. Uh, disgusted with himself and what he was doing to the way Juliet looked when she looked at that gas mask that she looked disgusted with what she was doing which uh, I do think was nice uh, foreshadowing uh, there so it did it did lead so I did like that it was a, it was a really uh, dark ending that I thought was really cool it was a, a good way to punctuate the episode so I thought it was a decent episode I think and had some interesting revelations I don't think it was great some of the character motivations were contrived but it was okay so anyway that is it that is it for part two of my coverage of season three or at least the spoiler free section of part two of my coverage of uh, season three so i will be getting into heavy spoilers shortly so those of you who have not seen to the end of the show will want to turn this video off now thank you so much for watching uh, be sure to check back here in two weeks for part three of my coverage of season three of lost uh, also check out my channel as i cover many more shows like game of thrones uh, star trek uh, the expanse uh, discovery and more so be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that and thanks a lot for watching but for those of you who have seen up to the very end of lost please continue on to my spoiler section which begins now so getting in spoilers we go episode by episode starting with starting with stranger in the strange land and as i said this this episode had no impact on this show whatsoever going forward so there's not really anything to talk about regarding spoilers um the one thing i wanted to say though is that this kind of reminded me in season six how uh the you know damon lindelof and the others would joke about oh you want these answers to these questions that don't matter why well, next thing you want us to tell us what happened to shannon's inhaler in season one and then they actually did that in season six which really pisses me off because there were important answers that they made it clear themselves in the episode that were important they wanted you to care about and they reaped the benefits of you caring about 
those mysteries. And then all of a sudden, they're like, oh, what do you care about them? Dickheads. But um, this is a case, again, where they have, like, it's kind of, even though it was earlier in the show, it's kind of reminded me of the Shannon and Harley thing. It's like, oh, you want the answers to the mystery? What about this mystery of Jack Tattoos? Nobody gives a shit about Jack's fucking tattoos. Okay, but the other thing I guess I could talk about with this episode is uh, Cindy and how we do see her later with the kids in season six and she's still like all other brainwashed or whatever. Um, I don't know. Don't really have much to say about that. Again, her appearance in this episode was unnecessary. Kind of just to remind the audience that she's still there. I think they should have done more with her. Is all I'll say. But anyway, let's move over to the next episode, which is Trisha Tanaka is dead. Now, I couldn't say this in my spoiler-free section because I haven't gotten to the end of Season 3, but we do know that the van, of course, will come back into use. So we needed this episode to set up the van with Hurley, uh, who finds the van and uses it to kill the others at the end of the season, which was really awesome, too. Uh, and also it sets up um, Roger Workman. <laughs> it was always funny. His name is Roger Workman. <laughs> but uh, it sets him up as that's actually Ben's father that we see in the flashback later in the season with and Man Behind the Curtain. Uh, so that that was cool setup. So I, I think, I see why that's cool setup. But again, you could have had that in like 10 minutes uh, of the episode. You don't need a whole episode devoted to that. Anyway. Um, let's get into the next episode, which is Enter 7-7. Seven seven. So I want to talk about the cat. And then talk about Saeed's cat. So we get the flashbacks, which are useless. I'm not changing my opinion on that. But in the flashbacks, you see that, you know, there's a whole story about the cat, the cat that the woman who was tortured by adopted this cat who was being tortured by kids, and so she relates to it. It was a cool story. But, cool story, bro. But, um, but then we see the same cat in present times, and Mikhail's calling it Nadia. And, uh, so, and then we see the cat after the station blows up inside, staring at it, because he recognizes it from the past. Um, and so this is kind of tying into Kate's horse, because this is what happened to Kate in season two, where she saw a horse when she first escaped from the marshal, and then she sees the same horse on the island. And so, if you listen to the podcast at the time with the producers, which I honestly believe listening to the podcast worsened my experience of the show because they promised a lot of things they didn't deliver and they often misled people and later and they would promise things and later would be like why do you want to see those things well because you promised them dickhead but anyway still got anger over that but anyway um they were saying in the in the podcast that um the site's cat and kate's horse would tie into the Box, the magical box, which I'll touch on shortly, which is mentioned a man uh, from Tallahassee. Um, but they never resolved it. They never really answered where uh, the cat and horse came from. So I look, in um, retrospect, I look at it as kind of nonsense, weird, just to be weird. And they never really answered it uh, in any satisfying manner. And uh, so I kind of think it's just a waste of time, honestly. Anyway, um, let's get into the next episode, which is Par Avion, and I want to talk about the bird, like the message that Kate, uh, it's Claire, sorry, to Claire, the whole episode is about her capturing this bird to put a message, and it's a sweet little message in the bottle, she takes up the bird, and it's never heard from ever again, which I think is a really missed opportunity, it's particularly when it comes to season four, because season four we find out that everyone thinks that the plane crashed and everyone's dead and that there were only a few survivors. And there's this letter out there that's contradicting that, uh, which would be really interesting. And it would have made a splash. It would, would have been interesting if this letter had come into play, uh, but it never did, so whatever. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's get into the man from Tallahassee. Um, so this is... Uh, so yeah, let's talk about the magical box. Now this is a thing that... You know, Ben himself said in this episode that box is just a metaphor. It's not actually a box. He was just using it as a metaphor to relate to John. So what was it then? What, what exactly, if it's not a box, if it's just like 
a metaphor for the island making things appear like, you know, Saeed's cat and Kate's horse, then, and then Locke's father, then why, how is that even the box? Why make the analogy if it's not an actual physical thing? I don't, I think it would be a bad analogy. I think the writers actually had no idea what the fuck they're talking about when they made this up because it's never expanded upon. In fact, I wish they would have just said that they kidnapped um, Anthony Cooper and brought him to the island before they lost like communication. That does make sense. And you could actually rationalize this by saying, oh, Ben's lying, there's no such thing as a magical box, which I think would be dumb, because why even say that? I mean, whenever we were theory crafting, and I heard a lot of theories, whenever I heard a theory where the basis is Ben's lying, I didn't like that theory because I, I find that a bit of a cop-out. You either take, even though Ben is an established, well-known liar, when it comes to establishing mythology, I think it's kind of a cop-out to rely too heavily on, oh, no, he's just lying, so it means nothing. But um, because in the episode itself, Anthony Cooper, or no, this happens later in the brig, Anthony Cooper explains how he... Um, was in an ambulance, he got in a car crash in Tallahassee, he was in an ambulance, and the ambulance driver smiled at him, and then he found himself on the island, or he, he, he knocked out. So that kind of implies that the others were there, they took over the ambulance, they sedated him, brought him on the submarine to the island, which would make a lot more sense than it being a magical box. <laughs> and I guess, as I said, you could rationalize it and just say Ben's lying. There's no such thing as a magical box. But then why? And then it pisses me off. Why even mention the magical box? But anyway, stupid magical box. <laughs> Let's get into uh, expose. Now, expose. I do have a few things I want to talk about. Now, when Nikki and Paolo uh, had the big confrontation. And, they, and Nikki, um, you know, poisoned uh, Paolo with the poison spider. But then all the other spiders came to uh, paralyze Nikki as well. If you listen carefully, you can hear the same noise that the monster makes. The like the, the horn noise uh, that the monster makes. Or no, no, it's not the horn. Sorry, I'm getting confused. It's the ticking noise. The you can slightly hear that in the background. I think that was definitely done on purpose. So when this first happened, a lot of people had theories about that this plays into the theme of judging that we saw with Mr. Echo earlier in the season, that the monster judges people, and if they're fit, if they're not deemed worthy, then they're killed off. So you could say, I saw a lot of people trying to say, well, it was the monster that was responsible for uh, calling those spiders forward to poison Nikki so that they died uh, because the monster found them unworthy. Um, which is kind of stretching it, I think, because he, it worked, the scene works without the monster because Art's established that the female spider exposition set up foreshadowing that, that the female spider could attract all the males and that's what happened, which I think is a, it's a bit obvious foreshadowing. But anyway, uh, so you could say it has nothing to do with the monster. And plus, like if you tied into the end of the show with the candidates, you could say, oh, like I talked about this before, how you could say, oh, well, the monster judges them and if they're deemed they fail the test and they're no longer candidates which i think is bullshit that's not really how um candidates were described but then again i always talked about how what the candidates are was they always play fast and loose in this which is bullshit and i'll get to that when i get to season six so it all doesn't make sense anyway so maybe you could say this but i think it's stupid and <laughs> uh anyway um, I thought there was something else with Exposé I wanted to talk about, but I can't remember, so I'll just move on. Uh, so this is Left Behind, uh, so let's talk about the monster again, because we, this is the first time we see the monster interacting with the others, and this is the first time we see that the sonic fence can keep out the monster, and this of course will come into play in, um, season six. This does have implications that the sonic fence was mainly there to keep out the monster, not the others, when the Dharma Initiative were around. Uh, and this is kind of implied, I think, in, in a later episode, Richard Oppert. I think season five, or... Is it season five, or is it... Yeah, season five, Richard Oppert says, um, yeah, that sonic fence is not going to keep us out. 
Uh, so I think um, it's implied, and I don't know how the others would get around it anyway, but, but it's implied that the fence is there more for the monster than it is for uh, actual people. And so it is interesting that to see the monster like ram up against the fence. And it does make one wonder what the Dharma Initiative uh, relationship was with the monster. Did the monster actually kill some of them? Uh, because the Sonic Fence only protects the barracks. They have their stations outside of there, so how did they keep safe from the monster then? It's a really interesting thing to think about, something that was never explored on the show, which is a pity. And they didn't really explore what the other's relationship were with the monster, for that matter, because why was the monster attacking Juliet? Why was it scanning Kate and Juliet? Again, you could say it's judging them, but um, again, this is not really consistent with what we found out what the monster actually is in season six. They kind of went in a different direction, so it's all inconsistent. Anyway, so anyway, <sighs> uh, let's move on to one of us, which I don't actually think I have anything to say about one of us other than i kind of spoiled this one on spoiler section but that juliet will change her mind and i think that was made a bit obvious too which is why i mentioned in the spoiler free section because just from watching this episode you can tell that uh, juliet wasn't in on it and that she would uh turn and be one of the good guys with jack and all that so it makes his ending a bit less powerful uh, but i still think it's good i still think it works um and I think that's pretty much all I have to say about uh, one of us. Uh, I don't think there's any other sort of injury. I mean, I already talked about middle of spine science and the fact that Richard Albert was uh, based off Island when really the science he's established in later seasons. But yeah, whatever. So <laughs> that is all I have for spoilers. So thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you guys in two weeks for part three of my coverage. Take care.